This is the future of biocompatibility industry, industry trends and hurdles. My name is uh, Matthew Jorgensen. Um, I'm really excited to be talking about this, uh, this topic. Biocompatibility is kind of a, a hot thing right now. There's uh, a lot of changes going on, a lot of things that are, that are evolving. So it's a really great and exciting time to be uh, getting involved with this. Uh, you know, I think that the, the industry as a whole, when it comes to biocompatibility, is really shifting towards more of a, a thoughtful and, and scientific approach to evaluating the biocompatibility of medical devices. And I think, in my view, this is a really positive development. And so it's, it's a great, uh, great time to be, be going into this. Uh, the, the topic of biocompatibility is really a very big topic. It's it's far too much to fit into the uh, the amount of time that I have here. We recently gave a, a three day seminar just on biocompatibility, and even then we were feeling a little bit uh, pinched. So um, you know we'll hit a couple things like really high level. But if you have any questions that you want to share with the group, I welcome any questions uh, throughout the the presentation. And also I should point out that uh, we have some more in depth and longer seminars coming up that talk about this as well as sterilization and packaging. Uh, the next one is in uh, Chicago on September 11th, so that's, uh, that's coming up as well and is available. Okay, so biocompatibility. Um, I, guess, I guess I should start with a little bit of an introduction here. So this is um, our consulting group at Nelson Labs. Uh, I have to point out that, that you know this photo is about two years old now, so it's a little bit outdated. We've about doubled in size. Uh, that's uh, me in the center there. So I'm you know Dr. Matthew Jorgensen. Just to give you a little bit of a brief introduction to myself, I spent most of my life in academia, you know, kind of like living under a rock, just reading science books alone, and uh, you know doing mostly chemistry and, and physics. Uh, both here and abroad until uh, I started work at Nelson Lab. So now I, I work with them focusing mainly on chemistry uh, st studies and things like that, you know, consulting on chemistry, uh, though I do a lot of biocompatibility as well, so it's been a lot of fun. Uh, the person there to my left is Dr. Sarah Campbell. She's our board certified toxicologist, really, really, uh, really great. Just standing above her is Trevor Fish. He's an associate toxicologist. And then on my right are uh, Audrey Turley and Thor Rollins. Some of you might know Thor Rollins. He's kind of like the, the grandfather of, of biocompatibility in, in some people's eyes. It's not just because of his age. It's also because he's like sits on a lot of these committees and is very, uh, very heavily involved. So all together, we make up the, the consulting team at Nelson Labs. Uh, the, one of the reasons why I like this photo is it kind of shows very visually how lots of different disciplines need to come together to really get the job done right when it comes to evaluating uh, the biocompatibility of a medical device. So you need experts from, uh, from lots of different areas to do this right. So what is biocompatibility? We should probably spend just a second to, uh, to talk about this. Um, you know, really what we do at Nielsen Labs and in a broader sense like Soterra Health, how they, you know, we do sterilization and everything with that is we want to ensure that the devices that you're bringing to market, you know, first do no harm. So if, if you think about what could go wrong with your, your devices, there's lots of ways that it could actually like really hurt a person. So sterilization is all about, you know, making sure it doesn't cause like a life-threatening infection and, you know, you kill the user of your device right away. Uh, with something like BET or these other tests that we do as part of cleaning validations, that's, you know, to make sure you don't give somebody a fever. And biocompatibility testing is more like taking a look at the safety of a device over a longer time scale. So we want to kind of make sure that you're not, you know, your device isn't going to like kill somebody slowly. You know what I mean? And, and so this um, motivation to make sure that devices, you know, first do no harm, this is kind of why regulatory bodies and, you know, groups like the FDA are existing in the first place, you know, to have, make sure that, that we're not, uh, not doing that. And the, the burden to make sure that your device doesn't harm a patient instead of help them is always on the, the manufacturer. So it's up to, uh, 
to us to make sure that, uh, that the patient is protected, that our device isn't going to, to harm them in any way. So that's, uh, that's what biocompatibility is all about. We see this sort of situation a lot, like uh, people will come to me, they'll say, well, you know, do we really need to do biocompatibility at all? Our device is made out of, you know, this ASTM grade titanium. It's been on the market for years. Uh, let's just submit it without, without biocomp. Actually, this sort of, uh, you know, statement comes up to me, you know, pretty regularly. I'd say at least once a week. Um, but uh, even in those cases, even if you have a very common material that's been uh, on the market for a long time from a competitor, biocompatibility is still required. You have to at least evaluate this one way or another, no matter what. If you submit something to the FDA and there's not biocompatibility, you're, uh, you're toast. So the ISO standard states, the biological evaluation of any material or medical device intended for use in humans shall form part of a structured biological evaluation program within a risk management process. It also says that biological evaluation shall be planned, carried out, and documented by knowledgeable and experienced professionals. So I've noticed that as well, that the FDA really looks for this, that you know, whoever is doing the testing or planning the testing is somebody that's truly knowledgeable and experienced and qualified to make that assessment. So how is biocompatibility changing? So this is you know, really not about you know, what we do for biocomp, but, but really how is it changing and evolving? What are the hurdles? So one of the key ways that it's changing is that we we're modernizing the, the testing approaches and uh, you know, the whole process of analyzing what the risks are associated with the device and so on. And, and so I like to give this example with these motorcycles because, I, first of all, I love motorcycles. The one on the left was my, uh, my very first motorcycle. That's a 1972 Honda CB350. That's a classic bike. It's carbureted, totally air-cooled. You know, for this reason, uh, so I don't know if you know, but Nielsen Labs is centered in Salt Lake City, and this is like in a valley by high mountains. So like you take the bike up in the mountains, and it's performing very differently along the whole ride, yes, because the altitude is affecting it, and there's no hydraulics, so you know, we have to brake you know, pretty well in advance, and so on. The, this old classic bike, you know, with the best technology of its day in the early 70s, is kind of like the traditional approach to biocomp testing. So these uh, animal tests and the testing methods were all developed in the 60s, and you know we're still sort of like clinging on to these and you know while they were great in, in the 60s and they still can technically get the job done you know get you from a to b there's really a lot better and smarter ways to look at and, and approach biocompatibility so it's, it's more like this modern triumph on the right there my current bike it's uh you know it has hydraulic brakes it has anti-lock brakes it can, you know i can actually pass somebody on the freeway there's a lot better way to, uh, to approach this, this problem. So in, in the past, one of the key limitations that I see was that it was much more of a, a checkbox approach where as a manufacturer, you might make a device, you'd uh, categorize it according to its patient contact and the duration of contact, and then in the, the old G95, you just uh, go down and sort of checkbox all these tests that you would have to do. And, you know, while you might, you know, kind of think that you understand the materials in your device, you didn't really have to understand them to get the job done. So long as you passed all those tests, that was, uh, that was fine. And so you didn't have to understand the testing. You didn't really have to understand your materials so long as it functioned and, and passed the test. And um, yeah, like I, like I said, what you would do is you would just categorize it and then look at this chart from the old G95 and you would just go across the, the row there and make sure that you pass all of those. Uh, but so it was really a checkbox check box approach. So, but now we, we really can't do that anymore. It's not in line with the modern ISO standards. It's, uh, it's, it's really not going to fly at all. So like this checkbox approach, I think now is fully right out. So, what that means is as you develop a device, you're going to bring that to market and you're going to submit this to the FDA as part of, say, a 510K, 
you really have to understand your materials and their impact on the body. And you also really need to understand the testing too. So I think that there's you know, a really big burden or an increased burden on manufacturers in terms of understanding. So like the, a lot more knowledge is required to do this correctly now than there was before. But the, the trade-off there is, is that you can leverage that knowledge to limit your testing burden and often reduce the amount of time and money that you spend testing uh, quite, quite dramatically. So, so there's a little bit of a trade-off there in, uh, in terms of what you need to do. So the, the modern approach to biocompatibility is all about risk. So uh, the, the new ISO 10993 you know, has risk all throughout the document and the FDA's uh, guidance document on the application of ISO 10993 is, uh, is all about risk. So what that really means is we need to understand what is the, the risk of our device and the materials and then how can we address that, that risk. So part of this whole program is to, to really justify the testing that you're going to do. So if you're going to do an animal test, it should be to address some risk. If you, you know, just blindly do an animal test without saying why you had to do it or explaining what the risk was, then that's not, not good enough because we really shouldn't be doing any animal testing unless it's you know, truly justified, right? So this, this is all coming out of the, the FDA's guidance document and, and I just wanna like, you know, read this one uh, you know, segment from their document because I think it's pretty important. So it says uh, for the risk management for biocompatibility evaluations that such a process should generally begin with an assessment of the device, including material components, the manufacturing processes, the clinical use of the device, and then considering this information, the potential risks from a biocompatibility perspective should be identified. Considering the biological impact, a plan should be developed either using testing or other evaluations as necessary to appropriately um, address the risk. And so for a lot of folks, this is, is something that's pretty new, and, but it's been something that we've been doing now at Nielsen Labs regularly, like every time for the, for the last year. So when we have a device that needs biocompatibility and it comes in through consulting, we first say, okay, give us a list of all the materials in your device and then tell us everything that you can tell us about those materials. And when we uh, say everything about those materials, we mean you know, more than just the MSDS sheets. So, you know, the material name, the formulation, the supplier, the supplier, supplier, all of this stuff. And based off the most, all this information that we can gather, we say, okay, here's a gap in what we know about the materials of the device. And, you know, to address that gap, we'll do this uh, testing. So when we talk about risk in this context, this comes from ISO 14971. Uh, it's the combination of probability of occurrence of harm and severity of that harm. And the, the reason why I want to identify this or, or point it out is because when we're going through this process of trying to pick which biocompatibility tests are really needed, uh, it's important to think about risk in this way because we get, you know, people concerned about risk across the spectrum. So for example, if a potential risk is since you know, the device would be commonly used in California, there could be an earthquake, and if there was an earthquake, a lamp would fall off and break off part of the device. You know, while that might technically be a risk, the probability of that happening is so low that you know, maybe we don't need to address that particular mode of failure for the device. If on the other hand, if a device has some sort of uh, you know, common problem where maybe little flakes of the device break off and are permanently left in the body, that's something that we would consider when we were making a biological evaluation plan. So we want to keep this in mind that we want to address risks, but we keep in, you know, into perspective the probability of the occurrence and how severe that, that harm would be. So as we go through this process, the, the full scope of the biocompatibility evaluation process. This is a three-step uh, routine. Uh, so a lot of this is, is pretty new. So step one, the biological evaluation plan. That's where you take a look at your device, identify the gaps and what you know about it, and test to address those gaps. 
Then, uh, then two, this is the testing and risk assessment portion. So uh, in the past, it would be those animal tests from the G95 that we would be thinking about. Now we have a combination of animal tests, and chemistry testing, and other in vitro tests to try to address those gaps. And then finally, the, the third step, and this is also something that's relatively new, is this biological evaluation report. So I don't know how many of you have like really submitted something to the FDA and set in some of these like uh, submission meetings, but the FDA really, really doesn't like it if you just give them like a whole bunch of test reports. In fact, they'll often just like return it and say, okay, thanks for the test reports, but what does that, that mean, right? So they really want you to like take a look at those reports, understand them, and then summarize the conclusion, just draw it right out for them. Say, okay, this was our device. Let's say it's like a neural implant. We did all these tests to address the risks that we identified in the plan. We pass all of those tests, therefore the device is biocompatible. So this, this final conclusion report, the biological evaluation report, is, uh, is pretty darn important. So we'll talk about each of these three steps. I have mentioned the biological evaluation uh, plan already. One of the, the main benefits of making a biological evaluation plan is that it gives you the opportunity to sort of you know, check with the FDA as part of a pre-submission process whether or not they'll agree with your strategy up front. And this can be a huge time saver down the road. You don't, you know, you really don't want any surprises, right, at the tail end of your submission because, you know, of course, this biocompatibility testing is coming at the very, very end of this whole, you know, product development cycle for you. And uh, if you're going to do something like, say, Say you have a titanium implant that's an ASTM grade, it's been tested a million times before, and you want to say, okay, look, FDA, we're going to just you know, demonstrate that this implant is very, very clean, and we can prove that this is the same grade of titanium as you know, these other devices on the market. And for us, that's good enough to evaluate biocompatibility. If you're going to try a strategy like that, the BEP is a great place to do that because the FDA can take a look at it up front give you some buy-in and, and maybe they'll say yes. So, you know, we have uh, this example that I just gave with the ASTM grade titanium. So we do see that occasionally and uh, sometimes it works. So sometimes with the, a really well-known material and good cleaning information, the FDA will say, okay, we, we understand this material is biocompatible and let it, let it go. So the biological evaluation plan is a great place to do that to get the buy-in from the, from the FDA. Um, it's uh, just, like I said, an outline of what the device is, what the materials are, what do we know about it. Sometimes we uh, explain why certain tests aren't necessary in there, and then you give the FDA uh, this information and let them see what they say about it before you get too far in, down the, the road in the evaluation process. Okay, so after you make that plan, when there, where there's gaps, then we start to talk about testing and, and risk assessment. And there's uh, lots of different ways that you could go about mitigating the risks that you identify in a biological evaluation plan. There's a material evaluation, so this is hopefully coming up upfront and could be a part of that plan itself. There's the traditional biological testing, there's chemical testing, and then there's uh, straight up written evaluations. And so in the past, really biological testing was the only option that, that we would consider. Now, you know, the, the landscape's opened up and material evaluation, chemistry, and these written assessments are a lot more popular. So the, the way that this is manifested, and this is from the, the new draft of the ISO 10993-1, uh, it's, it's not out yet, you can see that rather than, you know, putting check boxes for all of these different biological risks or endpoints like cytotoxicity and sensitization, instead of having an X there, it's, a, it's an E, right? So that means that rather than making it look like you always have to do those tests, it means you really just need to evaluate those. And this is, this is why it's more, more opened up. You can see the one thing that is an X, though, that's uh, checked for everything, is material and chemical information. 
you know, that's because you know obviously chemistry is the the best and uh, you know it makes sense that you should really be uh, be understanding the chemistry of the materials of your devices yeah so I, I think that this uh, this graph really highlights if anything this shift in strategy to think uh, to shift our thinking from okay we just need to do this testing and pass to really evaluate those risks and so I love that this is included in the in the guidance document. Okay, so we could go through and talk about all of those tests in detail. I don't think that's really the, the point of this, this talk. If you are interested in talking about the tests a little bit more in detail, we have a, a, like a half day seminar tomorrow where, where we're gonna at. What I really wanna do is uh, highlight how some things are changing in this landscape. So, so one of the ways things are changing is that we have some new in vivo alternatives to common and very popular tests. So, uh, so irritation testing is one of what we call the, the big three. So if you look in the 10993-1 the and the FDA guidance, this is required for all, all devices. And uh, traditionally the irritation test is a, it's an animal test uh, with, uh, with rabbits where you would you know, essentially either put a device or put an extract from a device onto rabbit skin and see if it gives them a rash. Uh, well, instead of using animals, we can use now uh, reconstructed human epidermis. So essentially what this is, is we can grow skin onto like a thin film membrane that's open up on the bottom and this, art of this grown skin on the membrane can receive its nutrients from below and it grows just like you know, regular human skin on the top, has ridges and everything that, that looks like fingerprints. And then since it's uh, biologically the same as you know, human skin, then we just put the extract on that and see if it causes an irritation reaction rather than using an animal. So, uh, so this uh, assay has been fully validated. It's uh, currently uh, in place at Nielsen Labs. We have a few manufacturers that are using it now. People are a little bit like nervous about it until they see like the FDA like accepting it regularly, but it's it's uh, fully ready to go. So I think that this is really exciting because I, you know it's a very very common test, and I love the thought of you know doing something you know, other than than testing on an animal. Similar to the irritation uh, test, sensitization is a test that we can now do an in we have an in vivo alternative for. This one's you know, maybe a little bit farther away from being widely uh, accepted to, to be used, but it's still uh, available. This is another, uh, you know, assay that I really like because sensitization is one of these tests that's required for all different device types. And it's one of those that also basically never fails when you test it on an animal. So I think we did this one time at Nielsen Labs. We tabulated, okay, of the last, you know, 5,000 tests, you know, which ones failed the most. And I think the cytotoxicity testing fails like maybe one out of 20 times something fails cytotoxicity when we run a test. But for sensitization, it's more like one out of 10,000 times does it fail. So it's just super rare. It doesn't really make sense to me to be, uh, you know, using animals for this test. And, and we have an alternative for that. So, you know, essentially you use this glutathione, which it was a good marker of a, of a compound's ability to bind to proteins and cells. So um, you can imagine if something's gonna be a sensitizer, it needs to be able to bind with proteins. So you use this glutathione and then you check how much glutathione was, uh, was bound up to compounds released from the, the medical device. So to me, this makes a lot of sense. It's in, in practice in places, it's a little farther away from widespread acceptance in the US than, than irritation though. Okay, another great alternative to animal tests is extractable leachables. So if you have any device that is permanently contacting with the body, and, and many devices that are prolonged also should, should be in this uh, group as well, but, it, but if it's permanently contacting to the body, then you have all of these really burdensome biological endpoints to address. So you have, uh, subacute of chronic toxicity, genotoxicity, chronic toxicity, and carcinogenicity. So those are all uh, endpoints that the FDA uh, need you to address to do that. And while there are you know, biological tests for that, including carcinogenicity, though no, nobody ever actually tests for carcinogenicity, 
it, it makes really a lot of sense to do chemistry testing for these types of biological endpoints. So if you have a device, I'll just say it again, if you have a device that's permanently contacting to the body and you're not doing chemistry, you really should immediately take a step back and think really hard about it because you're likely you know, spending about $200,000 too much and wasting a lot of uh, weeks of your time. Uh, so the, the way that this works to address those endpoints is that we expose the device to solvents. So we'll say water and an alcohol and maybe a nonpolar solvent like hexane. And we see what chemicals or compounds can leave the device into those solvents. So we say, okay, well, those compounds could contact the body and then we will do some toxicological evaluation on that. So just to be clear, because I'm, I'm going to spend a couple of slides talking about chemistry testing because you know, I'm a chemist, uh, I'm going to use the words extractables and leachables. What that means, just to be absolutely clear, so extractables are chemicals or compounds that can leave the device when exaggerated and aggressive conditions are used. Leachables, on the other hand, are what can leave the device and contact the body under simulated or clinical use conditions. And you know, ideally, if the experiment is set up really well, everything that's an extractable would also be a leachable. Depending on the, how the device is, you know, they might not overlap perfectly. So that, that picture's a little bit of, of uh, an exaggeration. So the way that I usually describe what this testing involves is with, the, with a real life example. So imagine that the device is the Spock hand, right? So this is a 3D printed device that's intended use is to be implanted into the body next to the heart so you can keep the memory of Leonard Nimoy with you always, right? And now if you were the Star Trek fan that was going to be the recipient of this implant and you started to think about like the safety of this device, you can ask yourself, okay, self, what sort of things am I concerned about coming from this uh, Spock hand? Would you say, well, you know, for me, I'm only concerned with like five common uh, plasticizers, let's say DHP and TOTM and whatever, and, uh, but nothing else. Or would you say, well, there's like six metals that this lab has validated, I'm only concerned with those. Uh, no, you know, you would be concerned about those metals and the plasticizers, but you'd also be concerned with everything else too, right? You'd, be th you'd say, okay, well, I know these compounds might be on there, but what about those compounds that I don't even know or suspect to be on there? Because we all know what it's like with suppliers upstream. You, know, you buy your raw material from somebody who buys it from somebody else, and you go one or two or three steps back, and you have no idea what could be in those materials as an impurity, right? So to do chemistry testing for biocompatibility, it's really important to do this in a way that opens up a broad screen where you look for anything and everything that could possibly come off of the device and contact the body. So that's, that's one key point. So if you're going to do chemistry for biocomp, it needs to be, include a broad screen. It, has, it can't just be targeted, it has to also be open. And it needs to include a variety of different analytical techniques that can capture all of the different possibilities. So, you know, as a chemist, I like to categorize and like group things. I mean, it's, it's my whole life, right? So, uh, you know, I really enjoyed making this little chart here. But if you think about everything that could come off of a device, you can start to break it up into different categories. You think about inorganic stuff and then all of the organic stuff. Then on the inorganic side, it's a little bit easy because you say, okay, well, that basically involves some sort of metal or metal oxide one way or another. And uh, you, know, you can take care of that one way. And then on the organic side, then we can start to group things by you know, probable analytical technique that can both screen and identify and at least estimate the concentration of what comes out of the device. So on the organic side, these are all chromatography mass spec methods for you know, really light and volatile molecules. We'll do gas chromatography for Medium-sized molecules will do another gas chromatography method. And then for very large molecules, these are a little less likely to migrate out of a device because of their size. But to check for those, we'll do liquid chromatography mass spec. On the inorganic side, we'll do something like ICPMS, maybe ICPMS and 
another ICP mes uh, method to try to screen for as many metals and their, uh, their compounds as possible. So that's the kind of like the suite of chemistry testing that needs to be done to make sure that you really adequately capture this whole spectrum of compounds. What about gas path devices? So there's a new ISO standard, ISO 18562. If you have a gas path or respiratory contact device, this can be really, uh, really important for you to know about. So I think that this was just uh, published completely in its final form I, in, in March. Now it's like slipping my mind when exactly it was. But um, if you have a respiratory contact device, standard applies to you and uh, it you know, targets the biocompatibility of these devices. It's a standard think was uh, really too like long in the making. I wish it could have come uh, sooner. Because if you think about respiratory contact devices, and I give the example of like an oxygen concentrator. These, uh, these types of devices, they really aren't amenable to like the classic methods of evaluating biocompatibility. So an oxygen concentrator, you know, a lot of them have say like this artificial zeolite material inside that like explodes on contact with water. So you think about how am I gonna evaluate this by like extracting it with some cells or like putting it on an animal, it just doesn't make any sense. So what this standard is all about is by taking a gas path device, running it or simulating clinical use, and actually measuring the, the volatile organics that come out in the gas, measure the particulates that come out in the gas, and if there's a chance that liquid could collect in the, in the device and run into the patient, then you also do some extraction and analysis of those liquids as well. So I think it's a, it's a standard that makes a lot of sense. Uh, I love that it's out there and yeah, it can really save you a lot of time and money if you have a, one of these types of devices. Okay, so once you've done all of this evaluation, this chemistry work, if you have a regular permanently contacting device or this chemistry with a gas path device, what do you do after that? So all of this should be followed by a toxicological risk assessment I have to mention that here because this is a critical step in that it won't do to do just the chemistry testing. Uh, the, the FDA doesn't, you know, won't really accept just raw chemistry results as, as part of this. So in this step, somebody who's qualified, and that should be somebody who has some uh, certification in toxicology, will take a look at the chemistry results and say, okay, wait a second. You know, this uh, plasticizer, I'm not really concerned about it. You know, it's above some threshold of toxicological concern, but we don't care. But this other compound, we should take a harder look at, something like that. Uh, and then the final, you know, the end point of the toxicological risk assessment is some conclusion that would hit all of these biological endpoints that you did the chemistry for in the first place. So it'll say something like, because of these results, we know that chronic toxicity, subacute, subchronic, carcinogenicity, and genotoxicity aren't a concern. So that should always follow up uh, on the, the chemistry results. Okay, so finally, let's talk a little bit about this biological evaluation report. I mentioned this before. This comes highly, highly recommended by uh, yours truly just out of this, just the outcome of many conversations with the FDA. So once you've done your biocompatibility testing, whichever way that you, you choose to approach it with just all straight animal tests or a combination of animal tests and material evaluation, whatever, you really need to write a summary report that outlines and summarizes all of that where you say, okay, here's our device. We, we thought about it carefully. We made a plan. We executed the plan and this was the result. This is what all of those tests mean. And this is like the cover letter to this big packet of information that you give to the FDA. Okay, so we just have a, a few minutes left. With that, I wanna talk a little bit about uh, written evaluations of, of changes. So this is something that's pretty important to biocompatibility. A lot of times, you've demonstrated biocompatibility on like a final finished form of a device. And then afterwards, somebody in you know, marketing is like, oh, well, we should really make this purple because our doctors love the color purple. And then you're like, well, 
that's nice, but do you understand that that's like a big deal? And they're like, well, we still really want it to be purple. And so when that happens, you know, it used to be that you really would just have to repeat all of the testing, right? So this is, you know, a $200,000 project to do all of that. But, the, you know, we have a really a lot of success and we've seen the FDA really embrace this idea of using some sort of biological risk assessment to try to address some of these, uh, these changes. So that's something that, you know, I highly recommend. It's a, you know, a really scientific approach. A lot of times when we take a look at changes like these, uh, we start asking ourselves questions like, okay, what really is the contact to the patient? And, you know, what is the, the probability that this change could have a negative impact? So for example, with this colorant question, you know, sometimes, say, if you're going from a purple to a red and you're just like taking out a blue dye, we can say, okay, look, even though the color has changed pretty dramatically and it looks very different, we're actually removing a risk because we removed a color. Or we might say something like, okay, we have this complicated device and they're making a change, but that change is so small that even if we did the testing, we wouldn't you know, these tests aren't uh, sensitive enough to even detect the change so we, we can predict the outcome of a test even without doing it. Or leveraging something like uh, the threshold of toxicological concern, and this is something that we do a lot, if you make a change to a device that results in an exposure to a patient that's below this threshold, it's one and a half micrograms per device for a permanent uh, contacting device, but 120 for a prolonged, uh, then sometimes you can say, okay, yes, we tweak the formulation a teeny bit, but it's less than 120 micrograms, and therefore it's not toxicologically concerning at all. And this is, comes in like a really nice, well-written document that, uh, that you can have on file, and if you're ever audited or if there's questions, then you can, uh, can show them that. Okay, with that, I think it's time to, uh, to just stop. I, I could just like ramble up here all day. But um, we want to open it up for questions. If, if any of you have any questions or thoughts for the group, we're happy to talk about those, uh, those now. So the question is, do these uh, reports with their titles, the Biological Evaluation Plan and the Biological Evaluation Report, is this really targeted to the FDA using their language or to European audiences? Is that right? Or to Nelson. Or to Nelson. So the, the term Biological Evaluation Plan and Biological Evaluation Report are really FDA terms. And uh, this these titles kind of evolved through conversation with them and our reading of their, their guidance on the application of ISO 10993-1. Uh, but as, as soon as we sort of agreed on those terms with the FDA, and it really was like a dialogue, then we said, okay, we're gonna, that's what we're gonna call these reports all the, all the time. So it's a, it's a title for a report that the FDA certainly will recognize and understand what it, what it is. Uh, we use the same terms when we uh, do work for European clients, though I think that it's uh, probably a little less specific to them. That's a great question. Yeah. yeah. There was a question over here as well. Yeah. Yeah. So the question is. So I'm, you know, kind of like pushing alternative approaches to biocompatibility up here. Are we actually successful in this? And so, you know, with the FDA, there's really no guarantees, right? You never know what type of reviewer you're going to get. So certainly uh, the official position or like the outward position of the FDA is that this is highly encouraged, right? So we're hearing this over and over again. They want a risk-based approach. They want to limit animal testing. They want like this thoughtful evaluation. And uh, we do this a lot. I would say nine out of 10 times, it's no problem. One out of 10 times, we have this more extended conversation with the FDA where we're really explaining 
again, you know, why we're doing it. I'm trying to think of a time where ultimately the conclusion was that we had to do animal testing even when we wanted to justify and I can't think of an example. So the, the worst case that it gets is that they say, okay, wait a second, we still want Genotox and then you have to get me on the phone and we you know, have a few more conversations. So, so far, really, really successful. Not 100% though, I mean, that, that's true. The, the beauty of the biological evaluation plan is that you can check with them upfront and if they agreed to it upfront, then it's great. If they didn't agree to it up front, then they might think that you're trying to sneak something by them, and then that's when it gets a little bit more complicated. That's a great question, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, gosh, I really love that question because you know you start to get into some of these details here, right? And you, as soon as you go, you start talking about chemistry and the evaluation of chemistry results, you rapidly realize that the devil's in the details and these types of concerns really, really matter. So if I understand your question correctly, it's how do we know or to what extent do we need to go to prove that 120 micrograms per device is okay? So these thresholds, the 120 micrograms per device and 1.5 micrograms per device if it's a permanently contacting device, are broadly accepted thresholds of toxicological concern in the toxicology community for compounds that aren't genotoxic or can't bioaccumulate in the body. So if you can make that statement that it's not genotoxic and doesn't can't bioaccumulate, then we've never seen any pushback on using one of these thresholds. And in uh, 18562, for respiratory contact devices, it has other thresholds of toxicological concern published there, uh, a little bit higher, that uh, we have also not seen any pushback. So this consensus that the TTC is appropriate is, is really well accepted. And, and I think that if you look into where that number comes from, it's just so conservatively derived that I think everybody can agree, like, okay, you know, we took like the most toxic cancer uh, causing compound that we can find and divide it by 10,000 and then this is the TTC. We, we kind of all agree that that's okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so the question was, if you want to do this Q-sub or pre-sub process with the FDA, with the BEP, what's the turnaround time like? So first of all, the FDA you know, claims that they are like very enthusiastically encouraging this process. They promise to be very nice and fast in their responses, and so far we've seen that. As far as an exact turnaround time, I think it's promised within something like 90 days but I'd have to go back and go back and check. So this is a pretty common route for us now, and we haven't really seen any big complaints from uh, from manufacturers. But uh, yeah. So should you wait while they uh, are thinking about the plan? I guess that depends on how much you trust you know, uh, us or whoever you're working with to like know, you know, have a pulse on the FDA and you know, what your appetite for risk of getting that rogue uh, you know, one out of 20 reviewer, right? So the most common path is that the longest duration tests, like the sensitization test, will start in parallel while we're waiting for feedback from the, on the BEP because you know, we basically know we're gonna have to do that test anyways, and uh, we might as well get it started for some of the other tests, then, uh, then we would wait. Any other uh, questions? Let's see if it's working. I was just curious how the in vivo irritation and sensitization compares cost-wise to the animal testing. Yeah, yeah so I have, 
I don't know, like 10 backup slides that are, uh, can be part of the presentation tomorrow on that so we can really uh, deep dive. But, uh, and I, I guess I can really only speak to the in vivo irritation um, off of the cuff. But that's been part of this big round robin and validation process. So they've, they've taken many, many compounds that are known irritants and tested them both ways at many different labs and uh, the, basically the correlation is, is totally there. So, you know, all that data is collected. We just published a peer-reviewed scientific paper that outlines everything. So, uh, yeah, I, I guess I can't really pull like the figure out of my head, but yeah, it's been tested very, very carefully against both models for agreement. Yeah. Okay, I think that that's, uh, that's it. I'm uh, available at our booth and tomorrow, so if you wanna keep on chatting, this is, uh, my whole life so you'll make my day by just talking to me at all so